everyone and thank you for attending. This careers and business lecture is going to be sponsored by a new USCL club from the Future Business Leaders of America organization called Phi Beta Lambda. My name is Victoria Landeris and I hold the secretary position in this club. If any of you would like to become members, just send me your email in the chat section. Also, for those of you that are um, that are getting extra credit for attending, I will be documenting your names and I will let the professors know that you attended. Do you have like a collection of course sets that you want? I'm excited to introduce our first speaker of this, this semester. She has a history with professional development starting during her college years. She has helped people on, uh, sorry. She has, from helping others define and understand self-worth on a personal level to educating people on how we are all a part of the workforce, no matter what field you are in. Specifically with the Workforce Innovation uh, Opportunities Act. Sorry, I'm messing up. But um, please welcome our guest, Tyler Calloway. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and I met Victoria through a program that we did, uh, the uh, Job Endurance Training Program, um, very interactive kind of soft skills training. So that's kind of how I'm back in front of you now. Um, and I'm glad I could be your extra credit. I hope it doesn't suck. I hope you aren't too bored. But um, <laughs> for those of you, um, Victoria knows that I, I do like to pick on people and kind of have conversations. So if I see your face, if I don't see your face, I like to be very interactive. So I intend to ask questions and I hope that you guys will kind of chat with me uh, because I think it'll make our time go by faster. And I think that's what we all want on this here Friday. So um, like I said, my name is Tyler Calloway. I'm the Regional Business Solutions Manager uh, for SC Works Catawba. Um, and operations uh, manager as well. Um, so I wear multiple hats essentially, but um, I have been helping people um, with their employability skills, with uh, their workforce developments for a very long time. This is just the first role with, which I've been in for the last three years uh, that I've been paid to do it. So um, I'm gonna get right into it. Um, and the presentation itself is just called, Would I Hire You? So we're talking about employability skills. We're talking about what makes you attractive. We're just gonna have a very open conversation, especially towards the end about what it is that you guys wanna talk about with regards to interviewing, things like that. Because I know that you know entering the workforce is gonna be something that's top of mind soon for you all. So let me share my screen. Let me see here. Can you all see my screen? I can see it. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful, wonderful. I hate that Zoom doesn't let you have everybody. Okay, here we go. Right. So, uh, would I hire you? Um, when you hear the name of this presentation, um, and without you guys knowing me, it's just, I guess it could be anything really. So what, what does it mean? What is, what is, what do you think that this presentation is going to be about? I want to, I want to see where your head is because I know that she gave you a little bit of a blurb about kind of what it is that I do, but what do you think that I'm going to talk about? Anybody? Maybe resumes and cover letters and interview skills and showing who you are to your future employer. Cool. Okay. Okay. So let's get into it here. So I, I like to lead kind of with a, a quote and this one is uh, to make sure your worst enemy doesn't live between your own two ears. And I think that it's very, very important that people understand uh, the importance of the role that they play in their success. Uh, so this is just something that I kind of live by because you are your own critic a lot of times. So I think that once you can kind of make your way uh, past that piece, you, you are really setting yourself up for success and, and a lot of different avenues. So that's what I wanted to start with, and that's by Laird Hamilton. So the agenda. Um, the first part that we're going to talk about is called, are you desirable? And that is not in the creepy way of desirability. I'm talking about, are you desirable to employers? Do you look like you're going to be somebody who they're going to want to bring in for an interview, right? The second part is going to be, what do employers look for? Third, easy disqualifiers. This is a part that we talk about uh, in JET. Um, and this is about the stuff that kind of uh, helps you lose a job before you even have it. So we're gonna talk about that as well. And then the last part, which is gonna be a little bit more of an open discussion is just gonna be a little bit about the interview. So let's talk employability. First and foremost, does anybody know what the word in and of itself means? Employability. I got one. What you got, Tenchi? 
So uh, how likely you are to be picked for employment, I guess. Okay. Missy, what do you think? Mute button is bottom left. Um, the, are you employable with the, do you fit within the realms of what the specific employer is looking for? Okay, cool, cool. So it defined is actually very simple and it's not super impressive, but it's just refers to the attributes of a person that makes them able to gain and maintain employment. It's nothing super special. It's not this light bulb moment that's just like, okay, so that's what it is. No, it's very generally speaking, that's what it is. So my next question, I guess, is how do you think that you get there? How do you get to the point in which people or employers consider you to be employable? So this is the area that I call the pre-check. So I guess this is what you can consider what you look like before you even get there. This is your on paper, but your electronic paper, I guess. So how do you look in the world of, um, in a virtual world before you even get there? What are some of the pieces, some of the attributes that you think that can help make or break you in this space? And I wanna um, lean on somebody who I can't see. And because um, I like your last name, Chloe Pepper, what is it that you think are important um, within this kind of realm when it looks to being, uh, when it looks like you're trying to be attractive to an employer? What are the things that are important that can make or break you in this space? Pepper. Okay, let's try another one. Ashanti Carter, can you hear us? Do you have an answer for this question? I saw you on mute, but I can't hear you. Ooh, I'm giving you guys a run for your money today. Let's see, let's see. Alyssa Cato, what about you? Okay, no worries. Well, the pre-check uh, that I want to talk about first is what you essentially said. Um, and you said it's it's Karis? Carice. 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 I'm terrible with names, so I'm just going to have to apologize a million times to you right now. But the resume, how do you look? Um, first impressions are lasting ones, and a resume is often the vehicle to either good to make a good impression or a poor one. So if you have an excellent resume and uh, being um, that millennials are about to make up maybe about 35% of the workforce within the upcoming years, um, this is one of those things, the very superficial thing that is gonna be very, very necessary for your success. So as somebody who, who hires people, um, if I come across a resume that is extraordinarily dense or unattractive, unappealing, you could be a rocket scientist and I wouldn't pick you up. And it's all about what kind of effort you are willing to put into getting the job prior to having the job. So you have to make sure that you have, and I'm not talking about it has to just be, oh my goodness, there's all these awesome, amazing things. Like I've never seen anything like this in my life, but just make sure that you're checking the boxes of density. Make sure that people have a lot of naked space to look at so that there are, because people don't read it. I'm going to be 100% honest with you. If I get a resume, I read the uh, professional summary. I read a couple bullet points in a couple little areas, see where you went to school, if you went to school, if you have any extracurricular activities, and that's kind of it. People don't give your resume the attention that you put, that you that you would hope that they do. And that's the unfortunate truth. I'm being completely transparent with it um, because myself and a lot of the hiring managers that I work with, they don't look at that 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 densely, unless you are somebody who has very technical, um, who has very technical requirements of what it is that you're doing then you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're giving them everything you've got with regards to all of your certifications, everything like that. So just make sure that you have something worth looking at, right? Next, we have social media, your online presence. This is the part that people have no idea that could absolutely break you before you even make it into the interview, if you even get there, because you likely won't if you've got something sketchy online. So right now there is a TikTok challenge called, what is it, the Silhouette Challenge? And it's cool, it's fun, it's whatever. People are trying to be cute during this challenge. Um, but imagine doing that particular, you guys are gonna have to just go look it up because I have nothing for you guys to watch right now. It's not appropriate for this particular <laughs> space. But imagine doing something like that and applying for a job, the job of your dreams, 
and we go to look you up because we do. We do look on, we look for you on social media, starting with LinkedIn, because of course that's gonna be the one that people always, professional, look to see where you are, what kind of presence you have. But social media, I'm trying to see if I can find you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I wanna see how wild your thoughts are, how wild your posts are, because it's gonna tell a lot about you. And a lot of times we have people who can find you. So if your page is not locked down, I, I absolutely recommend doing that. So right now uh, I have all types of social media platforms, but it's so locked down that you cannot see it unless I, I let you see it. That is a very, very important thing. So if you're out here, especially with political things, religious things, you have to be very, very mindful of the way that you look online. So the quote associated with this one is that social networking has become the primary way that people communicate, but it's a double-edged sword. Employers have access to your personal life, likes, dislikes, political views, good and bad behavior. It's important that you be digitally dirt free. So um, for me, one of the things that are super, super beneficial to me, and it makes for an excellent icebreaker for my interview is that on paper, I look like a white man. My name is Tyler Calloway. People do, people do not expect me <laughs> when I walk in there and I use it to my advantage because it is just this, you, do, you just never expect me. I, the amount of times that people are just like, oh, wow, I had no idea. And it's just, I, I use it. I'll say, well, now that we have this uncomfortable moment, you have to give me the job. So clearly that's it. So it's just, it's, it's you gotta use those weird elephants in the room to your advantage. So um, especially when you're doing emails and I don't have my pictures attached to my emails or anything like that, of course, um, people have no idea what you look like. So you have to give them everything you got on paper without it being too much. So for me, um, I don't even want you to think that I'm a woman on paper. I don't even want you to judge me based off of that. So the color of my actual resume header is like a burnt orange. So I'm playing into what you're already going to think of. And I use that to my advantage. Now it's not, you know, everybody can't do that, but um, there are people who will judge you off of your name, off of uh, whatever kind of affiliations you have. If you're, um, if you, talk about doing donations with the church, they're gonna say, okay, well, what church is it? You have to be very, very mindful of what your, your presence looks like. So culture, this is the vibe check part, right? Hiring managers are particularly interested in how a candidate is going to adapt to their unique organizational culture. So within my organization, I don't hire anybody that I feel like would not get along with the rest of my team. If there's something, and they can pick up on it in the interview, easy. If there's something that feels like, mm, you're gonna be messy, you're not going to be somebody that I'm going to be willing to, to, to stick my neck out for. And I'm certainly not going to expose my team to you as a new, as a new team member. So you have to be very, very mindful of that in the interview. So now that you're here, right, this is the, um, the other part of, of interviewing that people really don't think about. They think, okay, I've got this bomb resume. I'm going to be able to get in there, get this job. It's not going to be a problem. The art of the soft skill. The hard skills will get you in the door. The soft skills will get you out the door with a job. So this is the thing. You can be a rocket scientist, right? It can be two rocket scientists. You look exactly the same, exactly the same credentials. If one sucks from a social skill perspective and the other doesn't, understand that the one who has good soft skills is going to be the one that gets the job offer. You have to understand that, that people do not hire people that they do not like. It's another very, very unfortunate truth. But if they don't feel some kind of connection, some kind of something that gives them that va va boom, you will not be hired unless you are just exactly what they need on paper. But unfortunately, we are in an era where people are not hiring people where that are, are not interesting to them, that they're like, okay, well, yeah, you'll probably be good at the job, but there's just this weird attitude that, that I feel like she had. So I, I can't hire her. So you have to understand who you're working with. So when it comes to soft skills, and you know that there's hundreds of them, what do you think is at the top of an employer's list when it comes to what they're looking for? Anybody, what you got, Tanchi? Uh, communication. Man, I tell you what, look at that. Number two, communication. Communication. Like that is, I mean, literally the absolute most important next to integrity, because that one came up first for a reason. Communication, because it's such a, multifaceted um, thing. It's There's no perfect way to communicate with everybody. Missy, what you got? People skills. People skills. So yes, that's a very all-inclusive kind of, um, I'm trying to think of what I would call that, um, your ability to kind of uh, interact with others. It still falls under communication if you really want to think about it, but it's absolutely important. So integrity, when we did a survey around the Catawba region uh, with employers asking 
what is it that you hire for? What is it that you fire for? What are you looking for? Integrity was the first one. So not even your hard skills, not even, you know, what it is that you can, what training, whatever you've done in the past, it's integrity. Can I trust you to do this job? Because think about it. Can you be my bank teller if you steal? Think about why people who are justice involved, people who have backgrounds have such a difficult time finding work because they believe that that charge, whatever it may be, speaks to their integrity. And we have a program within our, um, within our organization that's called um, the reentry program that deals specifically with people who have been incarcerated and are trying to reenter the workforce. A super, super difficult body of people to work with. And I say that just because, for instance, um, the one offender that people are always just like, oh, you're never gonna get a job, that's gonna be rough, is a sex offender. Okay, everybody knows that that is somebody who's going to be a very, very, very difficult person to find a job for because it is uh, somebody who's immediately labeled violent, right? Um, and then the actual act itself, um, if you think about what that can include, um, makes it very, very difficult for anybody to even want to stick their neck out for you, whether or not you've been in prison for 20 years or not. So also think about this because this is one of those things where we have to think about it from so many different attributes. You could be a sex offender for a lot of things that have nothing to do with rape. That's one of those things that we figured that we found out um, with one of our during one of our HR cafes with a lawyer. I mean, it's and we're adults here. I'm just going to go ahead and say if you have sex in public and you get caught, you could be labeled as a sex offender for the rest of your life. Right. So these are things that just this moment in time can impact the rest of your life. And it's so difficult to get those expunged depending on the, the depending on what crime it is but integrity is the number one thing that people will hire you for and will fire you for communication being second of course adaptability nobody wants somebody who is rigid they want you to be able to roll with the punches and i'm, I'm not talking about some of the they could just ragdoll around i'm talking about somebody who still feels like okay i mean right now we're doing this right now in a virtual environment because COVID is a thing, if you think about that, right? Because this is something that I would have definitely lo loved to do in person because I love to physically pick on people as well. Not pick on you, like pick on you, but like I would have been like, hey, James over there, tell me about this. Come write this on the board. Like that's the kind of interaction that, we, that I'm accustomed to when it comes to presenting any kind of information. But you have to be able to roll with the punches because what I'm not gonna do is be in a room full of people <laughs> when, when COVID is running rampant. So it's, uh, it's one of those things where you have to be able to maneuver the environment that you're in when you're in it, right? So trainability. This falls very, very close with adaptability because if you are not trainable, if you're somebody who is just who just has such specific requirements in order to understand something or are unwilling to learn something in a different way, you will become very, very unattractive to an employer. So even if you already have the job, Think about what you want to do. Do you want to do you want to grow within that organization? Do you want to be promoted? Those are things that you have to think about um, when you're being trained, when you're being cross-trained, when people are trying to teach you things. They think about that. So even internally, if we have a role become available, um, which was our re-entry navigator role that I can speak about, um, there was a lot of internal interest. And because I know all of our team members, and this is a member of my team, I, sp I paid very, very specific attention to some of the things that are on this slide. I wanna know what kind of communicator you are. Do you have integrity? I need to know if you're trainable because this is a brand new role that, that our area has never even seen before. And I need to make sure that you're adaptable because it is a crazy role in and of itself, right? So I call this area, pull your pants up. I have a very, very personal dislike um, for people walking into interviews and I can see every single inch of your tidy whities And it has happened to us time and time and time again. So if that's what you want to dress like on your own in your own free time, do what you do. I don't care. I, I can't, I can't I do what you do. But coming in to the interview, most, uh, most recently, one of my worst ones, I've had somebody come in to an interview with his shirt tucked in his pants, but his pants were too big and his underwear were outside of his shirt. So the pants are too big. He was, he was sagging. And I saw that his dress shirt was tucked into his drawers. I just, I had no words in that particular moment. It was, and it's something that you don't just say, Hey, by the way, what do you have going on there? So we just went through the interview. Like it was just a standard kind of 
experience. So this is where I wanted to speak to some of the easy disqualifiers. Now, and I call this the slide, how to stay unemployed with um at the very top. Why do you think that I named this slide, how to stay unemployed? And Victoria, I want, I want to ask you, because you sat through jet with me, when it comes to easy disqualifiers, things that will help you lose a job before you even have it, what do you think about? Not being prepared, like not knowing history of the company you're trying to apply for, like, uh, like get a job with, you need to know what they do and what they stand oh, for. Oh yeah. Like have questions Absolutely. ready. Absolutely, I think you hit on at least three of them actually. Mike, what do you think? What are things that are that can keep you from getting the job and keep you unemployed? Trying to figure out how to make this thing work. Um, well, obviously some of them that you said were, uh, if you come in looking like that you don't want the job, if you're not dressed. Uh, and one of the things that I would add into there is um, we've become a more casual society and a casual workplace. Mm -hmm. But I would always overdress for the position. You know, they, they can, you can dress down once you actually get the job uh, to their standards, but I would go in overdressed. Um, so I would throw out dress code is a, is a big one. They're going to make first impressions when you walk in the door, mm -hmm. you don't make eye contact and you don't shake hands. And yes. You don't yes. use um, uh, proper um, vocabulary and diction. Mm -hmm. and, yep. uh, and I swear, Mike, you hit about four of them. And to add to that, them. I've, I've also heard how, um, some companies will look at how you interact with the receptionist if there is one. Yes, yes, yes. Missy, what do you got? I would think um, that a lot of employers now, they also have a tendency to look at the ink you have on your body, the way mm -hmm. that you have your hair, mm -hmm. um, you know, just your overall look, piercings, um, I, you know, it doesn't disqualify you as being a competent person, but I think those things come into factor. You see, Missy, that's such an interesting one. And that in and of itself can be an entire conversation because it really depends on who you're in front of. So I have a friend who's a physician that with a white jacket on, you would have no idea how much ink he had. But as soon as he puts it on, it, you can't see it. But without it, there are, there's this automatic distrust of this of this of this guy who's got all this ink, even though he's got all types of degrees and could save your life if if, if necessary, right? So it, it depends on it's a, it's a generational thing, it's a personal thing because there are some people who could be my age, your age, whoever's age who just don't like it. It doesn't matter how old you are; they just think it's they just it, they just think it's slack, right? Personally, and this is something that I bring up in Jed as well. I've got tons of tattoos, tons of them. Okay. And uh, it's not anything that you would ever just outwardly see without you know, me being in a bathing suit on the beach or something like that. But I understand that that can play a role in whether or not I get a job. One thing that I did, and I'm just gonna blame it on um, COVID being, making the world go upside down is I got my nose pierced in like August. That is one of those things where I was just like, Tyler, this is gonna keep you from getting a job if you ever wanted to get one. And then I had this moment where I had this conversation with myself where I'm like, you know what? I really actually don't care if you're not gonna hire me because this, is in my nose and you can see it's very very small like I did that on purpose I don't want this big gaping thing on my face but it's like if if this is something that's going to keep me from from working here with this in, in this organization then I probably don't want to actually work here and you need to understand that it's a two-way street you work for them yes but it's a, it's a relationship that that needs to be uh important on both sides you have to dig your employer and your employer has to dig you so this list is most very it's a very personal list to me because it's when I'm when I'm looking at at, at hiring folks and things like that it's very, very personal to me. So um, being the first one, people have no idea how incompetent and um can sound. And it's really just to fill the space. It's just to make sure that you're that you're not having a whole lot of silence. It could be a nervous thing for people. It's the hardest thing to break for people where people are just allowing the silence to exist. It's very, very difficult to get rid of the um or replace it with something that's gonna be beneficial to your interview process. Another thing, being late. That is an immediate, I'm not hiring you in my book. Now, I've had people who I've interviewed who like literally got into an accident 
And I'm just like, okay, that's, I'm not going to hold that against you at all because that's not, that's not your fault. That's not, and I mean, if you have real, cause life happens, you can't be so rigid that you're not permitting people to have these opportunities because of life. Being late though is a no, no. If, and I mean, unless it's, it's, you know, one of those life things, truly take, take the trip the, the day before, make sure that you're, um, that you know where you're going because I'm directionally challenged. I have no idea where I'm going at any given time in my life unless my GPS is on. I know how to get home and um, to my mom's house. And that was recent. Like I am, I struggle in a very, very aggressive manner. So uh, also one thing to add yeah. is that like, personally I have ADHD. So sometimes I struggle with time. So I will make sure I'm an hour mm -hmm. early so that I have time because mm -hmm. I know myself. And I want to give myself that extra time to make sure I am at least on time, even if I'm waiting in the parking lot. For See, a and that's hour. good because the next one is being too early, because what you don't want to do, even if you're sitting in the parking lot, which is good, stay there, you know, walk in about, you know, 10, 15 minutes early. But if you go into the lobby and you're like, hey, um, it's I have a, a 3 p.m. Uh, interview. What are they going to do with you for two hours? That's weird. Why are you sitting here for two hours? It's just a weird thing to do there. I'm, I'm sure they're not, they're not going to send you away or anything like that, but be mindful of that as well. Um, bad hygiene, that is huge. People have no idea how offensive bad hygiene can be. And I'm being completely transparent in this part. And because, you know, also people have stuff that they cannot, that they can't help, right? So there's some things you can't be mad if people have outbreaks on their face. You can't be mad if people sweat when they're nervous, but you can kind of help not eating an onion sandwich and hit me in the face with your breath right when you get in there. Save the onions for after the interview. Certain things that are, are easy to, to avoid, throw on some extra deodorant if you're a sweater. One of the things that I said for people who have hand sweat, because that's, a re that's something that really, really stresses me out when I shake somebody's hand and it's, and it's moist. I know that's a word that people hate, but a moist handshake is very, very creepy to me. Um, and it's something that people can't help, but it's because uh, I'm, a, I'm a germaphobe in that way. But it's just, if you get that, that weird, like it's, it's weird. It's a very weird thing. So it, it's, it's, it's one of those things for me that if you're a hand sweater, drag your hand up your thigh and then shake somebody's hand. They won't think anything of it. Literally just drag your hand up your thigh. It dries it off. It will save us all from the weird thing. That's just like, clearly your hands are moist. So um, being rude to the help, the help. That was something that Victoria said. If you mistreat my front desk person, you will not get a job with me because it, it shows how you treat people um, prior to you know you getting in front of the people who you think matter. Do not mistreat my staff. Do not mistreat anybody in this organization. I don't care if they are my janitor. Do not mistreat the people in this organization because it speaks to who you are as a human being. So people don't understand that. I ask them every interview, how did they treat, treat you when they, when they walked in here? Well, she side-eyed me. She actually ignored my, my questions. Oh, okay, well, she doesn't have a job with us because that is inappropriate. That's inappropriate. And our, our job where we exist is helping people. So if you just feel like you're too good to even have that, that piece of communication, then you certainly can't work here. Um, attire is huge. So that's something that Mike brought up. Just dress, dress for the job that you want. Even if you're going to McDonald's, throw on some slacks, throw on a dress, a dress shirt. It shows that you actually care about what you're, what you're interviewing for. Even if you're gonna go work at a construction site, all you gotta do is throw on the slacks one day, one day, just to get through the interview or if there's two, two rounds of interview, get through it, right? No resume. So we are still in an, in an age of electronics. I likely have your resume. It's likely sitting right in front of me on my laptop or already printed out. But if you don't come into an interview and say, do you need a copy of my resume? That to me, and I might be old school in that, th in that, in that thought process or that line of thinking, but it speaks to your preparedness. I like to see that you have that. Even if I'm not going to use it, I like to see that you have it. So um, eye contact. This is one of those things that you want to balance. Don't be a creep and stare into my soul for long periods of time, but still make sure that you're giving people the amount of, uh, of, of eye contact that's necessary that says I'm speaking to you or answering your question. Um, no notes. Come on. We got we to gotta at, least, at least scribble. So act like you're writing something down. You can be literally writing twinkle, twinkle, little star. Just act like it. It makes you seem like you're having... Uh, an involved conversation, like you're that you're actually submerged in what it is that you're doing. Um, lack of preparation. I already spoke to that part. You suck at the humble flex. So what this is, the humble flex, right? If you think of people are flexing, they're showing off, right? You have to be able to speak to the things that you've done in a way that makes you attractive, but not braggadocious. 
So you have to, and I, and I, and I can speak to the, to the women in this space too. You have to be able to say, I have done these things without being like, and I did it by myself. Even if you did it by yourself, and this is men too. Nobody wants somebody who's going to come in and say, I did this, I did that, I did this, and I did that. Nobody cares. That's great. That's awesome. It, leave it for your resume. But you have to make sure that you're humble with the flex, but it still exists. Make sure that you can do it with a little bit of a, you slide it in there almost, or you can add we or my team or you know collectively we or I led. That makes it seem that there was multiple people in this in the situation, right? Um, just be good at making sure that you show yourself off because if you don't do it enough, you're in a situation. If you do too much, you're in a situation. So it's very much a fine, fine line, just like eye contact, because you know, the creepy stare is never, that's that's never gonna work for me. And I don't think it works for most people. So flirting, I had to put this one on here because um, <laughs> of a, it's, it's a long story, but regardless, this is not something, yes, yeah, Stenchy. Uh, so I have a question about the um sure. one. Uh, is it okay if you say like, can I think for a second or something like that? If you, it's a hard question. It's, it's, I have no issue with that. And I think that being transparent and allowing yourself to be who you are in an interview will always give you the most brownie points. So if you're somebody who's just like, okay, let me get, give me a second to get my life together. Like to me, that even if you said, let me get my life together in that moment, because I actually think it's a comical, <laughs> a comical phrase, I wouldn't take off a single point for that. Because you're 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 telling me that you're paying attention, that you want to actually give me the best answer possible. Now, if you give me a weird long thirty second pause, that's when I'm gonna be like, okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next question because this is clearly not one that we're gonna get to today. So, you you saying, can I think about it, or just being silent for a moment? That's not a problem. You just have to make sure that you're not doing it for every single question because it's gonna get tiresome. So you got to be quick when you need to be quick. But if you truly need to think about it, give yourself the opportunity and figure out what that phrase is that that you're comfortable saying that shows who you are, but still gives you the opportunity to think like you need to. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Your phone. I don't even have to go into this one. If you are the type that's like literally texting or answering phone calls or playing um, Crash Bandicoot on your phone while you're in an interview, you don't deserve the job. That's just what it is. That, that's, that's not. You can be detached from your phone for, for an hour. Um, and I'm saying uh, this from somebody whose phone might as well be attached to the side of my face because of how often I, I have to be in it, detached from it. If it's important, you'll make the time. Um, verbal vomit. You cannot talk too much. There's nothing worse than me asking you how long you were at your last job and you giving me a five minute response for something that you could have been like three years, six months. That's people, I mean, I have just like Victoria, ADD, seriously. I lose, like I have the attention span of a squirrel. So as soon as I get my answer, it's like my mind just veers off into, I mean, I could literally be thinking about, do I need to buy my puppy some food? I mean, what am I gonna wear tomorrow? Literally my attention span is non-existent. So you have to make sure that you're getting to the point that you're giving them what they need. And if you have to be a little bit more lengthy with your response, you have to throw something in there that's going to break that up. So for me, I always bring humor into a, into an interview. I always bring it in because that's who I am. That's how I communicate. And, it, and I can tell you right now, to this day, I have never interviewed for a job that I have not been offered. I have a 100% success rate. Now, have I said no to some jobs? Absolutely. But I have always been offered the job. So, um, and that has just been running with the be authentic to yourself, be authentic to the process. And it's been the most successful thing for me. Yes, ma'am, Missy. Um, this is a statement, but also kind of a question for you as well. I'm going back into the workforce at an age where most people would be considering retirement. Um, there are a lot of young people out there that's probably going to be going for the same positions I am. What would make me stand out or hinder me in such a way of getting the positions that I want? Well, it really depends on the role that you're going for as well. So at the end of the day, there's nobody who's going to do you like you, right? So you're always going to bring your unique flavor to whatever role that you're going to, uh, that you're going for. So you have to make sure that whatever is unique about you, whatever is unique about your experience, that you let it shine because there's nobody who's going to have your individual experience. And that's another thing that I don't discriminate about when people come into my door. I don't care how old you are. If you can do the job and I like you and, and I have faith that you are going to be able to be successful in this role, I don't care. 
I don't care. You can be my grandmother's age. And that's another thing I think that we can give millennials credit for is that we do have a, a, a more open mindset when it comes to hiring. We're not looking for the youngest. We're not looking for, you know, the fastest because sometimes you don't need to be fast. I need you to be, I need there, there to be quality and not quantity. So you have to be able to bring you to the table. So if you have, if you're going to be a teacher and you're like, I actually, you know, taught special ed students for uh, 16 years, that's immediately going to make you more attractive than somebody who just came out of college. You understand what I'm saying? Um, so it's sense. just, it's, it's, you have to play to your strengths. If you know that there's something that's very, very attractive to you for that role, use it. You have to use it and you have to let, you have to show them who you are because at the end of the day, like I said, people do not hire people that they don't like. So you have to make sure that you are giving them your, the authenticity that it, that is you. So it's, it's, you can't, you can't help if somebody's coming with PhDs and 35 years of experience or five years of experience, but they did it under the president three years ago. And it's just all this crazy experience. They could have done all those things and still suck. It's the interview that's going to, that's going to make or break you. It's the soft skills that are going to make or break you. They, I have been in rooms with some of the smartest people who have absolutely no social skills, absolutely no soft skills. And it's just like, I'd rather not talk to you at all. I know that you're very, very smart, but my God, I can't even get through this conversation with you because you're dry. You're dry. You're a dry human being. And I think that you, when people rely too heavily on what they think that they know, they forget that they have to do all these other things to be a human being, right? So you just have to lean into that because you're always going to bring something different than, than, than everybody else, always, because there's no, there's no two Missies. There's none. There is another Missy that I know, but you know, you're Missy Melton and that one's not. So um, just make sure that you, authenticity is going to be at the top of this message. You have to be your authentic self through it all, most definitely. Um, energy and tone is huge as well. If I feel like you've got an attitude, if your energy feels weird to me, and I'm just like, did I personally do something to you? That's not somebody that is going to get hired. People do not hire people they don't like, right? Weird weaknesses and strengths, okay? This one is, <laughs> so you know, they always ask you the question, okay, where do you think your weakness is? What do you think your strength is? And people never want to really give it to them. So they give them these cookie cutter. Well, I just feel like I love too much. That's weird. Why would you say that in this interview? Like, it's just, that's a weird thing to say. Make sure that your weaknesses align with what your weaknesses actually are, but they still speak to your strengths at the same time. So it's, it's, and I, and I, it's, it's a, it's a weird way to say that, but um, for me, work-life balance is a, is a problem. I literally, I mean, I'm consistently working and it's nobody's fault, but my own, that is an extraordinary weakness to me where I, where that disconnect, um, is, is not there like it should be, but an employer loves a workaholic. I don't care what they say. I don't care if they like to say, Hey, I love, you know, work-life balance is important. They love somebody who they feel is going to bust their tail for them. And that I will always do most definitely. So. Um, you have to make sure that your weakness still highlights the things that are very, very impressive about you, but not a fake weakness or a weird one. So if you want to say that your strength is, I don't know, picking up stray kittens, what does that have to do with this actual job? Unless you are working with, a, you know, a homeless shelter for, for animals, like we need, we, we need to understand the relevancy of your kitten love. So um, just make sure that you are very, very, um, politically correct in your weaknesses and your strengths. Um, do you have any questions for me? Victoria mentioned that. If you don't have any questions at the end when we ask you, do you have questions? That's not us asking, do you really have questions? That's not us being interested in if you have questions. You should have questions. It is a trick question. You should always come with questions. Even if they're stock questions, always come with questions. Always, always. Because it just show, it shows that you're interested. It shows that you did your research. Any opportunity to show that you have looked into this business is one that you're going to want to take. Um, I don't even know what this, okay. Poor recovery. If you have a weird moment, you have to be able to recover from it. It's one of those elephants in the room that, that people, like if you accidentally said that you had uh, diarrhea before the interview, that's a weird moment. That's a lot that you just shared there. You have to be able to recover from that. You can't just stay in that place that's just like, oh my God, I just messed that up. You have to either use it and be like, okay, so that was a moment where I shared too much, but, and then lean into something else, but you have to be able to recover because that energy, you have to draw from the positivity. You have to draw from the energy of the people in the room. You have to create your own energy so that you can shift theirs as well. So inconsistency, AKA you lied. Do not get caught up lying about something on your resume. 
or when they ask you about something on your resume that you lied about, put on your resume, can't speak to. You have to be very, very mindful that the things that are on your resume, people will sometimes read, especially if they're big, important things. You have to be able to speak to them. Attitude, body language, we talked about that too. Lack of preparation, or no, what was it? That was money talk that came up. Do you think that you should talk about salary during an interview? No? Why not? Are you asking everyone? Yeah, I'm asking all of you guys. What do you think? I think so. You think you should? Okay. When yeah. it's appropriate, I guess. What is appropriate to you? Like at the right time. <laughs> that was a politically <laughs> correct response. Okay. So, okay. So for me, this is one of those absolute no's. I don't talk about salary during an interview unless they introduce it into the conversation. If the, if the person interviewing you says, okay, well, how much uh, did uh, compensation are you looking for? They introduced it. That's a question that you're gonna need to be prepared to answer. But you don't go into the interview and be like, oh, so do you have any questions? Or like, yeah, so you said that this pay is $50,000, right? That's not, do I have benefits? Like you cannot, and I've had all of that in an interview where I've just been like, wow, wow. So this is what, this is what we're doing. So that's not something that you wanna introduce yourself. If they introduce it, cool, but it's never something that you want to do for that first interview because they have all that information. That's why we spend 36,000 years filling out their application online. They know exactly what it is that you want. They're looking to, to, to slip you up or they're looking to see, jog my memory to see if I could just disqualify you real quick. So be mindful of that as well. Um, no follow-up. You always have to follow up after an interview. Always follow up. If you, even if you can't, find, if you can't locate an email address, uh, a phone call, I have handwritten my, my thank yous, which has actually really been successful for me in the past, where I have just uh, addressed it to where, you know, where I knew that I had the interview if I don't have any email addresses. And I'll say, um, you know, John Doe, and I'll literally handwrite, thank you so much for the opportunity to interview for this role. Always pull from some of the good things that you talked about. I look forward to hearing from you soon. Hopefully I'll hear from you soon. However you want to word that. But you writing it, nobody does that anymore. Nobody does that anymore. It's like this this vintage touch that people are like, oh my gosh, a handwritten note, look at that, you're fancy. And it's just been, it's just been phenomenal. Like, so I'm, I have ever incorporated that um, unless I have the email address and they wanna do it that way um, because it also depends on how fast the mail will actually get there, all those things. So like I, a lot of times have them partially written in the car and then I will literally finish it in the car because I already know who I'm interviewing with and drop it in their mailbox as I leave. So I know that in the morning, you're going to get my, my handwritten note. So it's going to look like, it's probably going to look a little bit creepy if somebody like got the mail right after, but okay. So you were just in here, but let it be creepy. Um, is that a chip on your shoulder? This one is one of those moments where if you had a really bad experience with a past employer, an interview was not the time to let that, to air out your grievances with that employer. That is an, that's like the, one of the biggest red flags where you're like, well, you know what? It's like, they told me eight to five, but I was there till 5.30 all the time. It's just like, okay, well, we're talking about this role in this moment. So not necessarily talking about that, but okay, the, thank you for that information. It, it shows that you're, that you're a, a, a begrudgeful individual. Um, even if you do have that chip, brush it off for that moment. And then you can put the chip back when you get in, when you get in the car, but just don't bring the chip into the actual interview. Um, let's see. TMI. So I already told you about the diary in the car. That's a weird thing. Make sure that you're not oversharing because they're easy disqualifiers. People will judge you based off of you saying, well, yeah, you know, me and my five kids got in the car. They're automatically going to say five kids. Is that going to prevent you from being able to come into work? What if one of them gets sick? What's going on? Like, there are things that will immediately pull you out of the running without you even knowing that, that, it, that it's done that. And too much information is one of those things. Um, one of the good cheaters, uh, cheat sheet moments is like, if you're in an interview with somebody and you see that they've got 10 pictures of their dog or something like that. Me, I can, I can dog chat all day. I, we can talk breeds. We can talk temperament. I can do it all day. I love animals. So that's one of those things where I could just be like, oh, it's a golden doodle, huh? And they're like, oh my God. And they'll go crazy and talk about their golden doodle because clearly there's 50 pictures in the room. You picking up on some of those things without being creepy, um, absolutely will work to your benefit. And LinkedIn stalking helps as well because they can see that you're looking. So they'll say, hey, Tyler looked at your profile. It shows that they're doing your, that, that you're doing your research. 
Um, so that's not a, there, there's certain things that could, that could seem creepy that are not, but then the really, truly keep creepy things like eye contact. That's not one of those things that we could just get past because it's, it's a weird thing. So you sound stupid. Um, this, this part, um, is where you try to communicate in a way that you're trying to sound smarter than I guess you are in that particular moment. And what I'm trying to say with that is if you don't know what you're talking about, you shouldn't talk about it be as transparent as possible because you sitting there stumbling over things that you think that you saw on Google is worse than saying that you do not actually know that thing or you're open to, to, to different training opportunities or opportunities for advancement and learning that and just turn it, flip it on its head and say that you are interested in the opportunity to absorb that information as opposed to saying that you know all this stuff that you clearly don't. You're setting yourself up to be disqualified. Um, the art of the pause, this is something that me and Tenchi were just talking about. Um, it's, it goes with the, um, so I'm good for an, um, I'll tell you that right now. I've been, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty decent interviewer at this point, interviewee at this point as well. Uh, and they still slide in there when I'm speaking to you guys, there's us and ums all through it because it's more of a, um, this is more of a relaxed environment, but it's still one of those things that I have to actively think about to make sure that it's not making its way into every single response that I have. Um, so now's not the time to suck. This is clearly somebody reaching out to shake our hand, right? This is just a slide that says, don't bomb the most important part. This is the interview. This is what we were just talking about. To me, this is just, this is the, this is the end of my presentation. This is where you can tell me, ask me questions if there's anything that, you, that you're struggling with specifically that we can kind of chat about. Uh, and then I can, I can free you all of, of, of my presentation. Missy, what you got? I think probably my situation is a little bit reversed, maybe from some of the, the younger students because mm -hmm. I was always, um pick up the application type person and hand it back in and mm -hmm. do an interview and now a lot of things have gone to zoom and digital and so that portion of it is still relatively daunting for me and new mm -hmm. um where i i i would just hand in my application and i would talk to the employer Personally, I was prepared for that already. Mm -hmm. And digitally, I'm not prepared. So I think that you're in more of the majority than you think when it comes to that, because we're all accustomed to in-person interviews for the most part. I mean, there's like a very slim 5% uh, because you know they're, they're based in Italy. So of course it has to be this, this kind of communication, but there's a lot of employers, a majority, a vast majority of employers like to see what they're working with. I like to see what I'm working with. Even through the midst of COVID, I've had like, I've, I, we've, I've held like maybe five interviews in the midst of all this. We just got a big old room and all were masked up because I, we need to see what we're working with. Um, so even for me, I hate interviewing this way. I lose my advantage of, of scoping my space. I lose my advantage of noting what kind of body language somebody has. I can't see what you're doing with your legs. I can't see what you're doing with your hands because people have tells when they're bored, um, uninterested, whatever. It's like, it's, like, it's like poker. You have to know what people's tells are and you lose that advantage when you're doing it like this. So even when it comes to presenting information, that has, that's something that I have an absolute heads over tails, absolutely prefer to do in person because I am a very move around in your face kind of presenter, because I know that I have, to, I, I have to train, I have to present like I like to receive information because I have this big of an attention span. So it's very, very important to me that I continue uh, and, and move in a way that that's interactive enough for, for to keep at least my even attention because I will forget literally what I'm talking about if I stay on that topic too long. But I think that you are, um, you're in the majority with that. There's a lot of people who really still don't like that. I, it doesn't matter how young, how old, how experienced, um, you just lose your, your natural advantage of, of the actual handshake, which is now we're moved to the elbow bump. Um, there's a lot of things because you can tell a lot by the handshake. If you shake my hand like a limp fish, I hate that. Do not give me a limp wet fish. Give me something, don't break my hand because I've had that too, where people, especially guys with really big hands, and I'm just like, oh, okay. Well, can't use my predominant hand anymore, but I appreciate you. So it's you have to, you have to be mindful of what that looks like because your confidence is, is what comes off in the handshake. So you have to figure out what's your virtual handshake. What's going to make me look completely different from Shelly and Raven and John and whoever? You have to make sure that you show who you are through this little lens. 
and there's not a good way to 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 really have to go through the ins and outs of, of what that looks like. But all I can go back to is being your authentic self and, and, and operating in that space. Because even though I'm talking to you guys through a camera, this is me all day, every day. This is not, this is just, this is just the way that I'm, I'm passionate about the information, of course, but I, I like this, I enjoy this. So it's easy to still do this, but it's still difficult because I like being in front of people. So you literally just have to adapt. You have to do this a couple of times, practice with some folks, um, and then just make sure that you're confident in the way that you're relaying your information on your resume, because the confidence is what will come through that come through that lens, 100%. If you know what you're talking about, if you're confident in, in the role and your ability to do it, that's still what will shine through throughout all of it. So it's 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 a it's a hard space to exist in because a lot of people don't like it. I don't like it. If somebody were to say, "Hey, we want to interview you and pay you two hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars a year," but it's going to be over Zoom. I would really be stressed about that because I don't like that because I lose that advantage that I, that I crave so much. So you just have to figure out the parts that really, really make you uncomfortable and exist in that discomfort to then make yourself better at it. And that's, that's the only thing because it's practice makes perfect. You have to do this more times, even holding meetings this way is practice. Um, so just make sure that you have, you know, get a friend with a zoom account and ask a random to do a mock interview with you or something like that so that you can at least get accustomed to the to the process of it so you're not fumbling if you wanted to share something on your screen or or whatever so yeah it's a it's a mixed bag because there is covid right so it's just it's got us all doing things a little bit different so things um one is uh, most of the employers that i talk to are still doing face-to-face -face interviews for final interviews they may do a pre-screening you know via zoom or, or some other online format is that what you're finding yeah and it depends on the industry sector um that that we're working with um so there are some like um say healthcare i guess um where your uh, certifications have to speak a lot for you before you even get into the door so you having all of these certifications um to go be um a registered nurse somewhere um they would be more comfortable kind of doing this because they just want to know that you're not personable, that you can have the bedside manner that's necessary, but those credentials and all those degrees are the things that are going to speak for your actual ability. Um, but a lot of these employers, a lot of them, I'd say 90% of them are still doing in-person interviews still because what is your, it's one of those things that won't What is your away. advice with phone interviews? <sighs> phone interviews suck even worse than these do. Um, you're, you're just going to have to be, hmm. you're going to have to take the same kind of advice that I gave for this, but without them being able to see you. So I know that some people get a really weird phone voice sometimes when they're nervous and it turns into, oh yeah, absolutely. And it's like, you can hear that weird shake or whatever you have to, that's the one part that you're going to have to work on the most, because if you can feel it, they can hear it. So you're going to have to work on the nervousness surrounding um, having a conversation over the phone. Um, and a, a lot of millennials don't even like to do that. So we're more uh, inclined to at least send you a Zoom so that we can see you before we have a phone call because people are like, just text it to me. We're, all, all, we're not a generation of people who like to be on the phone anyway. So that you can use to your advantage just because there are a whole lot of us in, in hiring positions. Um, but it, now the, the phone, that, that is, a, is, a, is a minority as well. So unless it's an HR person calling you to set up a virtual interview or an in-person interview, I, there's, a, they, there's not a whole lot of that, but there are a lot of people um, that you'll find who will just waste your freaking time on the phone interview because, you know, those little Ponzi scheme folks, um, they'll love to have you on a phone interview because they <laughs> because it doesn't matter what you look like. They just want you to get in on the scheme. So it's... Um, there's, there's not a good answer, but besides making sure that you're confident, you have to be 100% competent and confident um, in the information that you're relaying. So your resume, know that thing from the front to the back, know exactly what you put on there and be able to speak to every single thing. Do your research because there is so much power in knowing what you're talking about because that's the attractive part about having an interview with anybody when it's just like, oh yeah, I, I saw that you guys won the award for whatever, whatever in 2013. So what do you guys think about when it comes to expanding in that area and, and doing this? And they're gonna be like, oh, so you're asking good questions. So it's, you have to be able to have big moments like that where it shows that you've done your research. It shows that you care about what you're talking about. And over the phone, the best part about that, even though I don't recommend it, 
is that you can do it in this in, com- as, in a comfortable environment as you as you please, right? You could be taking a whole full blown bubble bath on an interview to, to make sure that you're relaxed and they would never know unless you're doing too much water movement. But um, for me, what's really beneficial is that I can have all of my notes spread out everywhere. So that's because, you know, you wanna be a little bit more proper with the space that you have in, in, in a formal interview. But if I have clippings of, of you know, things that I saw about them, they made CNN news or they made Fox news or they're on Google for this and they have this, I can put everything everywhere. So I can literally have access to every single thing that can make me feel and sound more like I know what I'm talking about, um, but in, in an, an environment that allows me to just not be quite as prim and proper as, so you just have to do things that compensate for the weirdness really. And there's there's not a beautiful way to say that besides that. Right. Yes. Okay, so what if you are interviewing for an award rather than for a job? Because I'll be interviewing for a 4-H award in a couple months, potentially. I would treat it like an interview, to be completely honest with you. They still want to know, um, they're still going to want to know what kind of information um, that makes you special, that like they wouldn't in an interview. They're still going to want to know what are you doing outside of work? What are your extracurriculars? Do you work? How? What kind of jobs are you attracted to? What kind of direction are you trying to move in? you're still gonna to wanna to treat that very much like an interview. Um, and I would take the all of the same skills um, that you would to an interview to that because you're still trying to be, whether or not being awarded money or a job or whatever, it's still an award. It's still something that you're looking to obtain. So you still need to put, you still need to give them everything you've got like you would in an interview and treat it the same exact way that you would uh, a standard interview for a job. But still, you know, make sure that it's, make sure that you're still sprinkling yourself in there with regards to your authenticity as well, because that's that's another thing. Even when it comes down to money, if you're looking side by side by somebody um, who has the exact same credentials as you, but they like that other person more, they're gonna get it. That's just, that's just what it is. I don't care what anybody says, I will argue to the grave with anybody. They're like, that's not true. We just, we hire anybody, we don't care. Okay, sure, that's fine. Um, that look at these freaking uh, luxury car dealerships with uh, what kind of people are selling those cars. Everything is very, very purposeful. Everything is about marketing. Um, so they want to be able to sell the experience too. So that's that's luxury car dealerships are always funny that way because you, you don't see a whole lot of uh, weird creepers selling cars. Um, or you, you see people who are generally attractive, they're, you know, smooth talkers, they make you feel good, make you feel comfortable, even if they're not somebody that you're personally attracted to in a physical sense, you can still be attracted to their personality. They like big uh, type A personalities. They like people who are, you know, extroverts, and they like people who can make you feel at home, make you feel comfortable. They will make sure that your experience matches what they want you to go ultimately do, which is buy a car that's probably overpriced. So you have to just make sure that you're, you're giving it everything you got in the way that you would an interview. Treat it just like an interview and you'll be more successful because then you'll go in there more prepared. So if you treat it like an interview, you prepare before, you'll be in a good situation. Make sure that you, you do your research about them. You know exactly what it is that you're uh, talking about, who, who you're talking to, and you'll be in a good position. I hope that answered your question. I think she's frozen. Oh, there she is. Any other questions? I have another question. Go, go for it. You were talking earlier about having, uh, you can look at, when you're playing someone, you can look at their social media sites and learn a lot about them. Mm-hmm. I don't have social media. So would that count against me? Um, first and foremost, good for you. You are in the uh, minority of people who, who, who are able to disconnect in that way. So that's awesome. Um, the only platform that I would say you should get on is LinkedIn. Because LinkedIn is not where you're just like, you know what, forget the federal government. I can't believe they forgot me. And that's not where you do that. LinkedIn is business. It is, it's literally your resume online. And there's a whole bunch of um, certifications that you can actually get through LinkedIn as well. It's called LinkedIn Learning. Um, where you can get a bunch of stuff that um, is free oftentimes um, that will literally go straight to your profile. And that's the first place I go before I go looking for Facebook, before I go looking for Instagram is to LinkedIn. 
I want to make sure that you have a LinkedIn profile. That's the only one. And make sure you have a decent headshot. Don't give us any of these. No selfies. Get somebody to take a picture of you. Get a good background, strong background. Um, nothing weird in the background um, because I we definitely run into some folks like that where there's just like clearly you were at a carnival holding an ice cream cone, but you cropped the cone out and you think that we don't recognize that that's a Ferris wheel. So you have to, you just have to make sure that your picture makes, makes sense. So if you're somebody who's, um, you're, you know, an animal person, right? It actually would make sense for your LinkedIn profile picture to be you with a snake. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So that's appropriate because that is the environment that you're looking to go into. If you look like you would do my taxes, but you're telling me about these cobras, it matches more if you look like Steve Irwin. You understand what I'm saying? So it's just, you just have to, you have to make sure that that presence is is good and strong because that is the direction that all employers are moving in um, because they hire on younger folks who manage their own pages. The, so the LinkedIn profile of the actual business itself, and then they will find you on that profile as well. So you'll see the hiring managers come looking for you and you can see the actual business link, their actual business LinkedIn page come look for you as well. So that's, the only platform that I would really, really pay attention to that you don't have to maintain too much unless you get a new job or you, cause you can say that you're looking for work on LinkedIn and you can literally look for work on LinkedIn and apply. It's like an easy, it's like a lightning apply where it's just an easy apply, uh, apply. Once you give them all of your information, you can just be like, oh, I like that job. Click, you're applied, click, applied, applied. So it's a very, very rapid and awesome, um, fully transparent method of getting work. So LinkedIn, 100%, my favorite platform by far. Yes, Tenchi. So uh, even, uh, I think, so I've had like two jobs, but they're like restaurant and like grocery store, well, like three, but like, uh, do I still put that on my LinkedIn, my resume and stuff, everything? Uh, it depends on how old the experience is. So the rule of thumb that uh, we always move with is 10 years. So if you have, um, so I'm 30 years old, right? So if I had, um, and I've been working since I was 15, my very first job was cleaning houses. There is no way that I'm putting that old job on, on my application because it is very, very old. So the rule of thumb is to just go back about 10 years because you don't want a resume that exceeds like two pages either. So if that's your most recent experience, then let it be because that is part of your journey. That is part of your trajectory. And honestly, um, customer service experience is huge for me. Uh, even when you're moving into a more professional space like this, when I see that people have been in service environments, it gives you a different um, edge than somebody who has been flat out professional their entire career. So even if you're in your um, interview talking about some of the work that you've done and you say, you know what, when I was you know, 23 years old, I worked at this little pizza shop and I did this, it, it shows, because you, you have to be a special type of human being to be successful as a server. I'll tell you that right now, 100%. So keep it as long as it's um, as long as it's not aged out. Okay. So even though it relates to the job you're applying for, if it's older than 10 years, you shouldn't put it on your resume? What you can do uh, is create a new space on like the bottom of your resume that says professional affiliations or something like that. Um, that's been a really nice kind of uh, thing that I've seen uh, people do where like if you're going for marketing and you have been in healthcare for the last eight years, but you want to show that that experience is still there, you can create a section that speaks to that little area, or that, that job that you've had because you want them to still know that you've had that experience. So yeah, no, most definitely. Yes, Missy. I know that with your references, you don't put mama down as reference, you don't put, <laughs> but um, what type of references are more preferred? They're always going to prefer uh, business references, professional references, always, because it speaks to your, your working habits. So um, if you, if you say, here's my reference and they're like, yes, I'm, I miss his mom and I, I birthed her and she's just the greatest person I know. Okay. That's great. But I need to know how you work. So if they ask for a personal reference and sometimes they will, they'll say, can I have one personal reference and three professional references? Give them what they ask for as long as you have it. Um, but also make sure that your references don't kill your job for you. I'm re I'm a, I'm a professional reference and a personal reference for a lot of people. And when I, when somebody asks me to be a reference, I take that thing so seriously. I'm <laughs> my, my brother's girlfriend is, is, uh, one of the people that, um, I just recently sold, I'll say, uh, to a business because when they call me, 
it's like you would have thought that they are just the earth, moon, sun, and stars. Because if I agree, I believe that to be true about you. So I give them everything. And we've done a lot of professional development things together anyway. So I can speak to that part of the professional development and the personal development. So I just, I do make sure that you are giving people good, solid references because your references will kill you too. We've had people who we thought we were going to hire. And then the references were actually people who probably shouldn't be the references at all because clearly they have an issue. They, they had a weird kind of conflict back in the day or something because that it was a weird situation where it's just like, all right, okay then. So yeah, you, yeah, just be mindful and be very, very strategic with the names that you give. I'll say that. I don't know, I'm going to have to step out, but before I left, I wanted to, number one, plug... Um, uh, the Phi Beta Lambda, uh, you know, that's um, organization of the future business leaders, you know, joining organizations and, and having uh, those extracurricular activities on your resume uh, will help set you apart from other applicants. Uh, so I would encourage all of the attendees to, uh, and, you know, specific for your discipline, I'm speaking specifically for business majors now, but, uh, you know, if, if you're going to be a science major, join the chemistry club, uh, that sort of thing. Those, those extras that you can put on your resume are going to be uh, critical in setting you apart before you even get to the revenue thing. Um, the, the other point I, I wanted you to touch on real quick is, uh, and you're part of this generation there with your age, uh, mm -hmm. is we've become a texting and, you know, use uh, acronyms and the, the BRB, you know, mm. that sort of thing. Um, the necessity for a much more formal communication, written and verbal and uh, the whole nine yards before the interview, you know, uh, with the resume and uh, post interview with your note back, the handwritten notes, super nice touch. And uh, I highly recommend everybody send a handwritten note and, you know, uh, instead of a text and you're used in acronyms all over the place kind of thing. And thank you so much, Tyler, for coming. It was, it was fantastic. I, I, thank you. I, I got a lot out of that. Thank you. I appreciate it. But yeah, the, the, the shorthand communication is, that is absolutely inappropriate. And like in, in, a, in a work environment, absolutely inappropriate. So yeah, most definitely be mindful of that. So um, you, you'd rather be known as a, as a too proper of a communicator than somebody who's a slack communicator. So just figure out where you exist in that place because if, if somebody texted me uh, TU for the interview, I would have been like, are we serious? First and foremost, how did you get my number? And secondly, why did you just say TU? So that is a very, very important thing that Mike just touched on um, about the professional uh, communication, even though we are in a generation where everything is very much text me, don't call me, shoot me an email, it still needs to be proper because those things last forever. So everything you say lasts forever in the le in electronic space. So just be mindful of that. Oh, Victoria, long, you're muted. How long should the resume be usually? Is it 10 I, don't, I don't say to exceed two pages. Okay. Unless you are somebody's CFO and there and you really just cannot get all of your very necessary experience, because once you start reaching, you know, C-suite kind of things, that's when I feel like, okay, you can give it a little bit more. Um, but for most people, uh, two pages is kind of the attention span of most people, because if you give me something that's four pages long, I'm not reading that resume. I'm just not. I don't go past page three. So you can tell me that you saved the world and cured cancer on page three and I wouldn't see it. So it's very important to understand that people have... Tyler and Victoria attention spans, not, they don't have this, let me read it word for word. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yep, yep I can. Oh, if someone's talking, I just wanted to say before everyone leaves, Ms. Plexco wants to say something. Thank you, Victoria. All right, guys, um, for those of you who I have not had an opportunity to meet, I'm the internship coordinator here at USC Lancaster, I have some job and internship positions open now. If you are interested in pursuing an internship especially or a job, uh, give me an email and be prepared to send me a resume when you do so. Um, my information is located on the USCL faculty and staff uh, so you can research my name. Also, um, 
maybe around the end of April, beginning of May, you're going to receive an email that you have been uploaded to our brand new college platform called Handshake. This is a platform that you're going to be able to connect directly with employers um, for jobs and internships. You'll be able to upload your resume, your transcripts and such, and be able to view um, all positions that are open from employers who are seeking either college students or college graduates. Um, so that's going to be a bonus because the system that we're using right now is antiquated, just a spreadsheet. No one knows where it's located. It's difficult to know what, what positions are still open for you. So that's coming. So we're going to have um, the ability to keep you updated very soon. So be looking for that email. And again, that is called the Handshake Platform. And that's all. Thank you. Mrs. Plexico, can you tell us what the internships are or where we can find the information about them? Uh, sure, I can um, let you know that the internships um, are for marketing, uh, graphic design, uh, communication. Um, I believe I have one that is medical and possibly one that is engineering. So, um, just give me an email and let me look at your resume. I will con connect you directly with the company through your resume. That's an amazing opportunity, by the way. We didn't have things like that when I was in school. Back, back in my day, it looked like it wasn't just like, <laughs> like eight years ago. But yeah, that's a, that's a really, really cool opportunity. So um, I don't even know, know the uh, ins and outs of it, but I certainly recommend it myself. <laughs> I recommend that, that handshake because that's, that's not an opportunity that a lot of people get, that direct contact with, with people who are hiring and, and actively seeking internships. So definitely, definitely do that. That's true. And USC Lancaster actually has purchased the contract. So um, it's not, it's free for students, it's free for employers, but it's not free for the college. So um, USC Lancaster deemed that it was important enough to be able to connect our students with employers and awesome. with community. Does anyone else have any questions or comments before we close? Yeah, I have one. So um, I'm doing computer science, which is, which is completely like left field from like restaurant stuff, which I've been doing. Should I just put leave the restaurant stuff on my resume? Just anyway, my customer service stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's still your work experience. So it's it's better than looking like you have never worked a day in your life. So because that's a that's an unattractive thing when people look like they have not ever had a job. Um, you run a lot of risk with that. So you have to, that's, that's still part of your story. That's still who you are. And that's still your experience. I would never recommend uh, taking away that part. Now, unless you had a job and it was like for 13 days and you quit because they were mistreating you or something like that, you could just act like that never happened. That's fine. But, um, you know, if you worked for at a place for years and that's what you've done, absolutely keep it on there. And then once you get the uh, experience that you're looking for and you've been there for a while, it boots those off of your resume because it's and it's no longer relevant. So, yes, Missy. Are your work study, um, does your work study work, is that relevant on your application as part of work? I would say so, absolutely, it, it, especially depending on what it is that you learned or you took from it. There's a lot of skills and a lot of like, say there was a, um, a platform, I forget what the name of the platform is now, I'm certain that it's uh, obsolete at this point, but there was a platform um, when I was in uh, college that I got to use through school that and they purchased it for, for our utilization. And it was very, very um, important for what it was that I was trying to go into. So that is something that I could say I had that skill take the things that make you most marketable out of the things that you learn and put it on there. Absolutely, you should. Absolutely. I don't know if you've seen the chat, but Ms. Campbell said, thank you. And this was great for our students. And Lauren is asking if it's okay to use a template for your, for your resume from Microsoft. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and also don't be afraid to venture out into Google because Word is cool and it's got some, some decent options, but there are so many free templates 
that if you go and look for something like for me, I like a very um, modern, simplistic, um, but still attractive kind of resume. Um, if you go look for that on Google and you're like, oh, I think I can work with that. And then you just download it and it literally will download in a word format. Then you can just you can mess with it the way you want to. So I started with a with a template that I that I liked that I could work with, and then I moved it around and changed colors and, and fonts to the, to something that I liked because I did not feel it like coming up with my own format. So it's absolutely fine. It's the that's the best cheat sheet in the world. It's something that's already created. It's that's what they're there for. Absolutely. Just don't set yourself up with a bad format. That's all. To make sure because they still even though they're in there that does not mean that they're good so be mindful of the ones that are word dense and things like that about the resumes would you say to put the most important information on the first page since that's what's most likely to be looked at it depends um your skill section should always be front and center um if you have this you know good marketable skills um, and it depends on if you have what kind of resume you have, because there are two different kinds. So if you've got the kind that wants to speak more to your experience, more of a functional resume, um, then that's where you can put the good, impressive stuff up top. But if you have a standard chronological resume, you would want to still put them in order the way in which they occurred. Um, there is a hybrid style, which is what I have. Um, my personal resume is, is, is kind of a hybrid um, where it's still chronological, but I pull some of the functional attributes um, that gives people like a little summary of my job if they didn't even feel like re reading the bullet points. So it just really depends. It can be it can be such a personalized experience making a resume um, because back in the day, I'm in business school. They say this is what your resume should look like. They were terrible looking. My first resume was terrible because that was the the resume that my professor demanded that. We use that little format, that little, I mean, it, we have come so far from the, you know, my freshman year in, in college, but do not let yourself get boxed into to what you see there. You can do it however you want. So if you are somebody you're like, listen, I just spent the last eight years in school and I really wanna um, put, you know, attention on the fact that I've got this PhD, put your your um, your experience up top, put your, your um, school up top, your certifications, if you're super proud of them, be proud of them, do what you gotta do, put them up top. You can do however you want, but you wanna make sure that you you are leading with the most impressive things in your bullet points. So if you go chronologically, you wanna, you, if, if you can, if you can um, quantitate any of your data, if you can put numbers or metrics or dollar amounts to any of the things that you've done. So if you were uh, in banking and you saved your organization um, $483,000, those are the types of things that are, that people's eyes are pulled to numbers. So if you had a if you led a team of 16 people, you'll automatically look at that 16, even though that's not something you're just like, well, what's that about? And then you end up finding yourself reading that bullet point. You want to lead with the stuff that is important, that is impressive, that is marketable, that makes you desirable on paper. Um, 